Well, before I jump in with any questions, I was, uh, I want to seek you on to introduce yourself quickly for, sure. you know, the recording. Okay. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm <laughs> Lily Homer. I just received my MFA from the Art Institute of Chicago in the Fiber and Material Studies Department. I work with themes um, of disillusionment and confusion um, coming from a perspective of the Jewish diaspora. I work a lot um, with different fiber art media, embroidery, crochet. Um, sometimes I do metal work, which uh, I think of as just also being an extension of that practice. Um, you might hear dog toys squeaking in the background. Um, I have a bachelor's degree um, where I concentrated in architecture um, and th that definitely has a strong influence in a, a lot of the forms and structures that appear in the work and also how I think about um, how systems are built, uh, like both literally buildings and also, you know, more abstractly like religions or like governments. Um, and something that was a big theme in my MFA show, which I'm hoping came across, but um, at, at least it was something that I was really focused on in, in sort of curating it and putting pieces together is having these overall forms um, that are made of component parts. And when you're looking at the form at any given piece in the show, you can, you can take it in as one big form, but you can also see what it's made of. And those internal components aren't lost. So there's this sort of sway back and forth between um, the pieces and what they create. And I'm hoping that that um, is a sort of metaphor for like larger systems um, where sometimes things can seem enormous and immovable and like inevitable, um, like economic systems or types of governments, um, which they are enormous. Um, However, they're also built of, uh, from component parts and from a series of decisions over hundreds or thousands of years. And once you can name those parts or visualize those parts, it can be um, maybe more within our ability to conceive of how to change them. So that's how I'm, that's how I'm approaching it. And a, a big part of my research arm, which is really important to me, is um, I've been researching um, a bobbin lace technique that was popular in Eastern Europe in the early 1800s. Um, it's called Spanier Arbit, uh, which is a Yiddish term, probably meaning spun work. Um, and only a handful of people can do it now. Uh, and I've been trying to reach people to try to learn it, uh, but it's kind of a secretive sort of an esoteric technique. So I'm thinking about it conceptually as well because it's unlikely I'll actually be able to learn it. But um, also that struggle to figure out how to learn it is uh, has become an, an interesting sort of just line of inquiry. Um, I think that's probably a, a decent summary. Yeah, we'll start there. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I was yeah. actually just reading that interview that you oh. had with uh, Jacob Carlin. Cool. cool. Um, so yeah, I, I thought it was really, really interesting. Um, last semester I did um, I did some writings on uh, sofferets and uh, different Shaviti um, texts and use of language and um, also just the use of uh, calligraphy and penmanship. And so, oh, so cool. I was thinking a lot of parallels in your work, um, especially with the wire, even maybe more so than thread, uh, just because it can hold a certain rigidity and shape. And so I was thinking a lot about, um, about that sort of history and those techniques and how ingrained it is to um, different histories. And um, I, so I found that entire article really interesting. So for anyone who's listening or who anyone who goes to the show, I would definitely recommend uh, reading that interview. But um, no, I think that's the really incredible work that you're doing uh, right now. Um, and kind of connecting to it, one of the first main questions I had um, was in the description of one of your most recent MFA lectures that you had in the, uh, the material and fiber studies department, uh, which you titled What We Can't Have. 
Um, and I think you use the term looking back out, uh, looking back at the blurry past. And so I was hoping you could talk um, a little more about how you think about history and how uh, the societal dialogues we as viewers are able to have through the materiality of your work. And so I was just wanting to know more about how you think of those materials in the connection, maybe not just to your own history, but your shared uh, history um, with Jewish people in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that, thinking of this as like a two-pronged question, I think I'll start with, because you have a background um, in Hebrew, I learned recently that there's no word for history, you, there's only remembrance. And I don't know, it, so you're nodding. Okay, good. I was like, I don't know if I'm misinformed, but I learned, I, I heard that idea and it kind of stuck with me. Um, so if in my ancestral culture, there is no sense of um, an agreed upon factual accounting of events, um, that's not the way I think in my culture in America sees the past. Um, like, I think I've often been taught that, like, we like to have a collective understanding of um, historic events. But the more research I do into the past, especially into um, crafts and arts that are largely process and material based, it just often doesn't work that way. I think that the way that we build up our understanding of what happened is through stories um, and through people's impressions of what happened. There can be material evidence um, that events have occurred, but that doesn't necessarily mean we know exactly how they unfolded. Um, and I think also material specifically offers us a unique way of looking back um, at what I'm trying to think of as just a, like a, a collective blur. Uh, I think, I mean, I think if textiles last longer in time, we would probably have a very different account of human history. You know, if we could actually see, you know, when the first textiles were being used or what they were being used for or, or out of what materials they were made um, in different parts of the world, um, it, you know, it would tell us about the technology of the time, what people valued, um, you know, if different people in a, in a village were using different materials, that would tell us about social hierarchy. Um, so I, so, and, and just because we don't have a lot of that evidence doesn't mean those materials don't hold that power for us now. Um, so um, when I'm thinking about Spanier Arbit, for example, I think about what it's made of and it, it's often, well, in the past, it was like very nice uh, tinsel, metallic tinsel, and it would be quite expensive. So you know, as just a very uh, simple example, when those are made, they'd be probably pretty expensive. So we can tell um, who the clientele would be, you know, people who either have saved up for a very long time to buy one gar garment, or it's a family that has more money and wants to, you know, be more lavish. And then what does that then say about the way people pray? You know, if you want to have garments that are very luxurious, um, are is that a way to connect with God? Or is that a way to show other people in your congregation how you want to interact with religion, you know? So um, I, it, just, it feels like sort of an endless world to explore. Um, and I think at least for me learning about history, it's, it's not the way I learned um, to sort of engage with the world. Um, so I'm trying to build, I'm trying to build out sort of a way of looking at things from there. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, I think that's that's really incredible. Um, kind of attaching to that, I was thinking. So in the same lecture, um, you mentioned. Um, I think the quote was asking questions that we can't answer. Mm -hmm. And now that we've brought up a few of these subjects, now I've I've been thinking: Is there? I'm assuming that there, to an extent, is a conceptual engagement you wish viewers to have with the unknown, whether that be history or even spirituality. And mm -hmm. I think that was something that was I was picking up on quite a bit. Um, like I mentioned before, I was thinking of calligraphy, 
um, I was also thinking of Islamic uh, jali screens, uh, which mm. usually has all of these multiple holes that allow the passage mm. of air through mosques, but also other architectural structures. And these smaller holes as being sort of representative of the multiplicity of God, um, or this uh, sort of uh, proliferation or um, maybe rippling of these sort of powers. Mm -hmm. And I was also thinking of um, your piece that I, I don't remember if it was in the show or not, but the uh, it was titled, But I'm Just Grasping, mm -hmm. uh, which has like the, uh, the, the inserts of the coats and all of these remains that seem to be from like rituals or rites, um, especially surrounded around meals, um, around uh, candles, all of these things. And I sort of was reading these uh, jackets and inserts as uh, these standards for bodies almost. Um, so that was kind of prattling. So I guess I'll go back to the, the main question, which mm -hmm. uh, is that something you want for us to be able to do is to uh, have those engaged spiritual engagements or think about those uh, in that context? Yeah, I think your reading of the piece, can you hear that lawnmower? Is that loud in the background? Mm -hmm. It's not, okay. Um, I think your reading of the piece is, is really helpful. Um, I was trying to bring in a sense of just like quotidian ritual, like dining dinner every night, which in my upbringing is often the location where religion would enter. We'd like sing the blessings every night uh, before dinner. And it wasn't necessarily a feeling of engaging with um my faith it was more um it was more taking from the faith those practices to mark a change in what we were doing to you know create um create a difference in the day where we sit down and like this is what we are doing now we are not looking at our phones we have created um, a space where we're um I don't know. It was it was separate. It was separate from like the worries of the day, which was very intentional and often hard to sort of disengage with whatever I was, um, you know, worried about right before dinner. But the eating ritual for me has always been, and like the kitchen table in general, and also the, I had the candles in that piece. Um, like the smell of a candle getting uh, extinguished for me is like I'm back at the kitchen table and I'm seven years old. Um, I love that you're nodding. I really hope other people feel that way because it's like such a strong <laughs> um, like sense, sense memory for me. Um, and I think, I, and I don't know necessarily how to connect these very gracefully, but uh, another line in my religious upbringing is this idea that um, the questions are way more important than our ability to answer them with any sense of clarity. Um, it's the engaging in debate. It's the um, constant questioning of any information that's being presented as finite or, or settled. Um, and it's not necessarily the ability to come to like a, a solid conclusion with the understanding that there might not be one. Um, and I think, I think World War II and the Holocaust is an experience that diasporic Jews look back on and and this is a it's a point where this idea is kind of clarified for me because if we don't look back and wonder how that could have happened how people could have done that to other people we ignore that it happened and yet we know we can't necessarily answer that question because to answer it uh not only to articulate something around it that seems cohesive seems to diminish what happened but also it, it would say something terrifying about humanity i think um and so the act of talking around it questioning around it um is something that can be um can help us remain hopeful um and also engage with the past and i know there are a lot of authors that that do work um, in that area, like W.G. Sebald um, writes, and he writes like around the Holocaust. He'll, and, and often in his books, he never names it explicitly, um, but you can pull out aspects of the characters or 
side conversations they have and go, oh, wow, I know that what that was about. And he didn't say it. And it, it is so much more powerful when it's not directly said. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that, that sense and, and like that idea of just asking questions that can't be answered, even though it was only sort of concretized for me when I realized this connection, um, it's, it's through everything in my life. It's like, you know, family dinners are just about argument and not, not in a, not in a mean or intense or, you know, uh, aggravating way. It's like, it's just how we connect. It's how we like show love for each other. Um, and I think that can be hard in art, but it's also often welcomed in art um, because I think art is like, it's like a materialized philosophy. Uh, and you know, it was like, if we had the answers, there wouldn't be philosophy. We wouldn't keep wondering. Uh, so it, I think I often feel like it fits quite well, but then in explaining the work, um, there can be a wall sometimes because there isn't necessarily supposed to be one simple answer though people really like there to be. Um, and then, you know, don't want to get into the realm of like, well, there's no answer, so I won't even try. It's like, there, you know, there's no yeah. laziness. It's just, it's like presenting things as open-ended. Um, but it's our, responsible, our responsibility to keep on pushing each other to try to answer the questions, even if we know that there's no answer. And then I think in that there's like a, there's like a weird hopelessness, but there's also so much um, optimism because we don't ever give up on these conversations. We can't. I mean, that's, like that's how we live. That's how we operate. That's what we're compelled to do. Um, yeah, that that that. But I'm just grasping piece. I think we'll go up in a show um, in a friend of mine's apartment soon. I'm really excited for other people to see it. Um, I really want it to be to people to be able to engage with it intimately, one on one, uh, with the candles lit and the fabrics. Where there's um, what's screen printed on there are edited images of the lace technique that I've been studying. That I was able to go and take photos oh. of it in a museum and they, they won't let me publish the photos um but I figured if I edited them enough and then reprinted them in a different medium you know it's like artistic uh what is it artistic. thanks art <laughs> yeah like it's in a different context so it's okay um so people can see how intricate and beautiful it is and I wanted that then to become an object that someone could take time with and connect with um oh and your question about the linings and seeing them as bodies so the the, the materials are linings. They're not from my jackets or anything. They're, they're purchased as mm. new jacket linings. Um, but okay. I'm thinking about linings as a material that's so beautiful and like looks really lush, um, but is created to be hidden. It's created just as a protector to protect the fabric that's on top of it. Um, and also to uh, protect the body um, and to sort of create this, this shield. So I'm thinking of like covering up this material, concealing, um, connecting to um, my inability to learn this technique largely through a culture of concealment. Um, it's, an, it's, an active, um, it's an active hiding. It's not that the information doesn't exist. It's the people who have the information don't wanna share it for various reasons. Um, so that, that's sort of my, my struggle to um, think through how to materialize it without actually knowing it through you know, other materials that are intended to be kept secret. Yeah, that's so interesting to me that you're, you're taking something that is intentionally hidden or Gnostic in some sort of way, where it kind of makes me think of Kabbalist, uh, mm -hmm. you know, also secretive techniques of um, this idea of not just passing along, um, language but tradition through very um, insular uh, communities or families mm -hmm. and I think it's interesting to take that and put it within a visual art context which is retelling the story in a way for other people to absorb it and it seems that and so you're like reversing this uh, sense of community and opening it up a dialogue to others that one might not even know what it is, but for some people that do recognize it, you're giving these keys to um, others that lie outside of a specific tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and I think that's a very interesting move considering how much effort goes into concealing those things mm -hmm. uh, and taking the jacket or in reversing it and putting that sort of membrane uh, outside for others to see. Mm -hmm. um, 
I really like that you mentioned the scent of the candles because I know that also in the MFA show you have your lavender piece that's all connected as well. And it's so awful because I, I have a terrible sense of smell. I think anyway, <laughs> it's with the mask on top of it, I'm like, oh, did I miss or did I miss a scent? And so oh, no. I I'm like, oh, like there's so many things that just COVID is destroyed for us <laughs> as artists yeah. and the scent was one of them uh, but I like the idea I love that you're thinking of introducing scent more um, into the experience for the viewer um, and putting it back putting this table setting essentially back into uh, an intimate space where this um, the ceremony or this dialogue would occur naturally mm -hmm. um, so I really like that parallel between inside and outside that I think you play with uh, conceptually in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, something that you mentioned made me think, especially when you uh, brought up like elements of the, the Holocaust too, and certain fears, I think, uh, not just societal fears, but there are a lot of fears we have of um, repeating histories. And I think that's one reason it's so important for those dialogues and for that information to be put up front and to continue to be discussed is so that we don't have this, you know, perpetuation of these evils that still live and act out around us. Mm -hmm. um, which leads me to another question I have. Um, in your piece, How Did You Know?, you use the satin stitch um, as a means to emphasize an already existing pattern. Um, although as you do it, you're altering its color along the way. And I, I, when I use embroidery, I sort of do it in a similar way. I tend to use 12 patterns, mm -hmm. um, but I, I think about it like as this um, alteration of something that's repeated over and over again thinking of it um, as a historical stand-in. Um, and considering your relationship to history, I was wondering, how do you think about pattern and replication um, when it comes to that work or how you think of the thread as a line of history that mm -hmm. uh, weaves through structures like that? Um, I know that was a long question, so I'll break that down again, which is, yeah. um, so I guess I just want to, I guess I want to know, like specifically your, um, Sorry. <laughs> do, do we need to do a bathroom break for the dogs? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, <that's> <laughs> um, and so I guess I just wanted to know more about that piece and what you're thinking when it comes to uh, pattern making and repeating, how you tie that to history, and then how you think about um, embroidery and the thread as being mm -hmm. connected to history as well. Yeah, I think the the first part is really relevant to how I, the process I went through to make those embroideries and how I came to the decision to re-emphasize parts of the pattern. Um, and then in other parts of the embroidery uh, spread, I, I was calling them, um, I, I was trying to think of them as like spillages, uh, like they would overflow over the sides of the edges of the shapes and spread, um, spill over. And I think I, I was thinking of my, um, my engagement or intervention with the original fabric as like every move I make uh, is a choice. And like you say, if this fabric is a historical stand-in and I'm engaging with it in an active way, what, what then? How am I engaging with it? What shapes do I make on top of it? Um, and I think in connecting with the larger sort of theme of the show um, in sort of revealing the pieces within a larger structure, I was thinking about tracing those shapes as a way to bring attention to the fact that this is a pattern that was at one point chosen and designed very specifically. The colors were chosen very specifically. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't come from nature. It's a human's representation of nature. Um, and so in drawing the eye back to the fact that this system exists, um, then moves can be made to change it as opposed to me just layering an entirely new shape and ignoring the fabric that was there before, which I think you know is a, is a type of move I could have made uh, and might in the future. Um, I thought it was more it was more engaging to me to think about 
acknowledging what's there already um, and then taking and then making moves to try to chart my own path from there like taking what uh, taking the materials that exist um, and shifting um, as opposed to sort of like perhaps a, a more um, a, a more rebellious um, action of you know just ignoring um, or rejecting entirely and, and I love which I also think um, <laughs> is like is kind of a it's kind of a conservative move I think uh, right now you know like it, in in politics and art I think there's definitely an inclination um, to say like screw what's already there uh, I'm gonna make what I want um, which I think is an entirely valid way um, to create culture um, but I I don't want to forget about uh, acknowledging that like when we produce new things, um, those things are also then going to be set as precedents. Um, and so we should also engage um, with our own choices, self, you know, auto critique, self critique, um, and in in acknowledging the the patterns themselves of the original that one would reject. Um, I think is it's it's another way to sort of take power from them or. Um, reveal them as not being inherent, as being a choice. Um, so that that's sort of my move there. And I think the second part of your question uh, with the, the thread of history, I think that, that, my first thought is that I think that's a totally relevant idea when it comes to other parts of the show, um, like the crochet, where mm -hmm. it start with like one long fiber that's, twisted around itself and condensed and combined and compacted, um, which is something that the Spanier Arba technique does. And also I've been trying to figure out how to articulate this. I've been thinking about a lot of fiber arts recently as like just a condensing of materials. It's like when things are layered and thickened, they make a lot more sense to us than if they're just uh, laid flat in long fibers. Um, but it, it's weird because in reality, we would see more of the overall material if they were just laid out flat, but they make way less sense. Um, and when they're combined, crocheted, knitted, made into lace, turned into a surface area, although parts of it are being hidden because of this sort of wrapping and layering, um, we, we still think we have a better understanding of the material or, or how to engage with it. Oh, and I really like that idea. So I'm thinking of, so in, in connection to your question, like the thread of life, it's like this process uh, through time, through the movement of my hand, creating this surface area that's then grown, um, but that comes just from one long, potentially endless thread. Um, yeah, and I also think it sort of creates a more realistic version of experience in life when it's made through the hand um, because I, and I think you know repeating history is like so my dad said recently and I'm, I know he didn't make this up but I don't know where the quote came from it's like history doesn't repeat it rhymes so you know events may come back around they won't look exactly like they did before um, but if we are looking for it we can find certain patterns um, and you know, in in knitting or an embroidery or in a crochet, when there's a new surface area created, and you know, the stitches a lot of the times are intended to look exactly the same along each row. Um, if it's made by hand, you'll be able to see uh, little um, not mistakes. I don't think they're mistakes; they're just differences along the way, um, which makes them way more visually engaging. Um, you know, if we wanted it to be perfect, we would put it on a machine. That's not the point of it. So. Yeah, I, um, I I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, and I think it's interesting that you bring up the idea of pulling the thread or any material and putting it by itself, um, which I think hints at institutionalization in a lot mm -hmm. of different ways and not just the way that we try and engage and parse things to try and understand them down to elemental levels, but pulling them from their own um, dialogues, separating them and putting them in a space um, that it just exists as it is. And um, 
I like that you said that his, or your dad said, <laughs> or pulled up history, history rhymes instead of repeats. I think that's a really, um, I think it's a far more truthful notion than to what I said. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I really like that idea. Um, and so I'll go ahead and move on um, mm -hmm. to another question that I had. Um, and it's really your use of stand in as wire. And I love your bobbin piece. And I love that uh, during its creation, it almost seems to create this sort of helix shape um, mm -hmm. as it's being formed. Um, or maybe that's how you formed it to display. I don't know. But I think about what, especially when I first started like learning how to crochet or knit, like that was almost always a problem that I had was that it would curl in on itself. And, uh, you know, I had to figure out why that happened. But I always thought that was such an interesting idea is that you're building a form that creates this helix shape and just sort of continues. Um, so I was hoping you could um, tell me us uh, more about the exchange of thread for wire. Mm -hmm. um, and my seminar recently that I had with Matt Morris was discussing uh, this really slow loss of knowledge for art and crafts such as tatting or other techniques um, mm -hmm. like you're using and thinking of the wire as being um, something that's incredibly archival and being yeah. able to hold that shape for much longer than some of these fabrics that would disappear over time. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, so yeah, so I was wondering if you could talk more about, because it seems like you added it, that's not your only engagement with metal. Um, you have right. that engagement with the thread, you, but you've also built these supporting beam structures for mm -hmm. the other sort of uh, in style, uh, in, in, installation style pieces. Um, so yeah, I was hoping you could just talk more about your engagement with metal in your work. Yeah. Um, I, I'm really into, well, I mean, you've studied language. I love how fi fiber metaphors are used to like apply throughout all like always it's, just, it's all everywhere <laughs> um even a thread you know uh like pull the thread on a story or a narrative um when people say that when a a fiber has um can like hold its shape we say that it has memory um and i think that that's so so true like if if you bend a fiber too far and then straighten it out again it'll retain that sort of kink in the wire um and if you try to spread uh flatten it out again the wire might break so um and that's also another move i mean wires split all the time but um i do like using metals in a lot of different ways i think it's it's an incredibly it's just it's such a variable versatile material when i crochet with it and it's like super uber thin but can still hold itself up and even after that bob that bobbin lace is made out of like really really um soft jeweler's wire it's not like um industrial grade wire and even that can then so hold this sort of spiral yeah and i didn't expect that i thought it would just sort of lay limp um but i but i i was i was so taken with the fact that it could retain this memory that i decided to put that at, at, to make that the way it's displayed um that it can sustain itself um even just a little bit you know it's not like creating it can't like support another object um necessarily but it can hold itself up a little bit um and like that those tiny little fragile moves all the way to the um the welded structure which and i don't as an aside i don't remember what compelled me to make them not hollow they're just solid <laughs> steel really rods. yes that's support that's support <laughs> it, is. it is heavy and really hard to move i was like why did i do that um but it creates this like massive larger than human scale structure that's holding up the embroideries uh and the lines are still not all that thick like they're it's sort of like the way metal is used uh, a lot of the times is a uh, within walls um, as like interior architectural support. Um, it's not necessarily the material that you see on the outside. It's like what's being used uh, 
I, I hate the word function. It's it's being used to hold other things up. It's not necessarily just to a, a visual. Um, and I think hanging the embroidery on them is a move that I made because I I love the way that the the shapes were created. Um, you know, to have like a, a filled in volume of the embroidery panel juxtaposed with the open square then above it of the that the metal structure creates. I was really interested in that. But if I were to take it further, I think I would like to have more interplay between the metal um, and the the other and the soft fiber works. Somehow make it so the metal structure is also reliant on the embroidery, so that there's more of a um, more of a reciprocal relationship. Um, I'm not totally happy with the way it is right now, but th those are like two entirely seeming like ends of a different ends of a spectrum of how to use metal. But I think of them as being really similar. And like the process, I'm, the mental process while I'm making bobbin lace is not is a very similar state of mind I'm in when I'm welding. It's like, um, it is all kind of just a meditation with this material that's either really thin or really thick or really flimsy or really strong. Um, and it's all, it's just like, it can take on all these different um, forms. And I think really easily just lends itself as a, a as a, a material that can be like um, applied to different metaphors pretty easily. And I think is pretty explicit and understandable. Um, I also think something that's interesting about metal is I is that we have, I think everybody has a different different or similar or what I, or either way, pretty ingrained association with different metals and different materials that we might not be totally aware of and might be more subconscious. Um, and I like playing with those um, associations. Like, you know, when, where do you associate very thin, delicate, um, gold wire with it might be specifically women's jewelry and why and can we shift that um, and what if we can show that it's really strong and can, can hold itself up or what if what what if we can show that um, you know it can exist as just an art piece and not necessarily um, only a necklace or something like that you know even though I love necklaces nothing against necklaces <laughs> but you know how can we like <laughs> shift use and, and shift perception um, and change what we associate with different materials and how they're used. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to like play along that spectrum, I think, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, that's, I have like one last question here. I'm looking at the time. So I know sure, that yeah, yeah. we can't talk forever and I hope <laughs> that we can set up because I want to, because I have a million more questions. I also I really to wanna a... hear about your background. I, I'm dying to hear about <laughs> calligraphy too. <laughs> I would love for us to have a studio visit, a Zoom, yeah. another Zoom visit sometime, because uh, I, I find your work to be so interesting. And now the more that we talk, I have like questions about like how you engage with uh, the history of feminism and mm -hmm. all of these other things with your work too. Um, but for now, because I know we're getting close to time, uh, one, I just want to put in um, for anyone who listens again to uh, check out the MFA page to see where your work is being archived. Um, your Instagram has a lot of this work too, yeah. which is what's your Instagram handle? It's Lily D. Homer. And I think my website, Instagram's a good place. My website's probably the best, the more comprehensive place. And it's just lilyhomer.com. So that's awesome. my pitch. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely go check those things out. Um, and the interview with you, again, I would recommend an uh, interview with you and Jacob Carlin, uh, searching for Spanner Arbiet, um, which I highly recommend reading too. I think it's very, um, it's a really nice um, parallel to what you're creating in the show. Mm -hmm. um, but my last question for you, um, is there something you wish for uh, viewers to take away from the MFA show, whether it be just your work or its placement in relationship to the things around it, uh, anything along those lines? Yeah, I, I would love for there to be a sense of like leaving the gallery after and ha and people having this like impulse suddenly to not walk by a building and go, oh, building. Like actually look like what's the material on the outside of the building? Is that the same as on the inside? What's between those? Like, how is that glass being held up? What am I looking at through the window? 
you know, I think, well, I, the title of my show is Trees for the, Trees for the Forest, which is a play on the phrase, don't lose the forest for the trees, you know, don't, don't forget about the big picture, don't get too lost in the details. Um, whereas I'm sort of flipping that and saying, don't forget about the details. Uh, don't be too quick to categorize or judge or uh, because it's so much easier to categorize. It's, it's a sort of a safety for us. It, it makes things make sense. Um, but, but there's so much that we can miss when we do that. Um, and I think like to, to practice that just in an everyday sense of like connecting with the material world around us, like every leaf on the tree is different. And I know that can be overwhelming to look at a tree and think that, but it is true and it is amazing. So that's sort of the, um, <laughs> That's my, that's my hope. I, and I, I genuinely don't know if that is um, yet coming across in the show because this, this type of work is something that I'm only really starting to understand myself. And I think hopefully in the coming years, I'll be able to communicate it um, much more clearly. Um, but yeah, I think that's primarily what I want, I want people to, to take from it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for Thanks your for incredibly me, thoughtful Lily. questions. <laughs> yeah, of course. I was having so much fun going through. I was like, oh, look at that. Uh, and I, and again, yeah, I, I would love to set up a visit with you because I, I like to think my parents are interior decorators. So I think Ooh. about architecture, interior architecture a lot. So, yeah. and especially now that I'm thinking about your structures as being walls in a way, and now I'm related to buildings. Oh, Lily, I have so many thoughts now. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and call it quits for this one then, or okay, at least great. the recording portion of it, but, um, I will stop yeah. It then.